It's November 15th, 1979, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. How many lives did he put at risk? No one can tell. Blunt's prison sentence should have stretched through decades. Instead, he roamed free and fated in the royal household, and that truly is a monstrous betrayal. So ran a Guardian editorial shortly after the events today in history in 1979, when the unlikely figure of Sir Anthony Blunt, the Queen's resident art historian, was outed as a Soviet spy. Yes, and Blunt wasn't some dusty little curator, you know, shuffling around the palace. He was a world-class expert on fine art, a professor of art history at the University of London. He was a favourite of the royal family. He'd been knighted in 1956. And yes, I think favouritism, you have to admit, has played some part when you can admit to MI5 in 1964 that you had supplied the KGB with intelligence and then you're allowed to remain a surveyor of the Queen's pictures until your retirement in 1972. Yes, and that's exactly what was being exposed by what uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, said on this day when she was responding to some questions from her MPs about this guy because news had basically started to percolate up about about the fact that Blunt had spent this astonishing amount of his life and career being a double agent and working for the Soviet Union. So what Thatcher said today was, in April 1964, Sir Anthony Blunt admitted to the security authorities that he had been recruited by and had acted as a talent spotter for Russian intelligence before the war. She continued in this vein and then spoke about the fact that Blunt had had these Marxist views as a member of a group uh, of brilliant Cambridge intellectuals known as the Apostles, but he was able to join the security service of the UK anyway in 1940 because at the time they said they had no reason either in 1940 or at any time during his service to to doubt his loyalty to his country. So he was just sort of whistled through and allowed, possibly because of who he was and his own personal pedigree, to fly under the radar, thus being able to deliver a frankly astonishing amount of intelligence back to the Soviet Union. So who was he and what was his pedigree? Well, he did have ties to the royal family anyway. The Queen Mother was his third cousin. (laughs) Uh, He went to Marlborough College Public School and then to Trinity College Cambridge, where he was sort of secretly recruited to what would become known as the Cambridge Five. All graduates of Trinity College who knew one another. That's what's kind of remarkable about this group of spies is they all worked with the KGB, but they all knew who each other was Kim Philby, who went on to work for MI6, including extraordinarily a period as head of Soviet counter-espionage. Uh, Donald McLean, who went on to work in the Foreign Office. Guy Burgess, who seemed to be almost sort of the ringleader, really, recruitment-wise, uh, who was in the British Embassy in Washington. And John Cancross, who was breaking codes at Bletchley Park and revealing secrets to the Soviets. Yeah, and I mean, bear in mind as well, of course, that Britain wasn't at war with Russia at this time, and that for many idealists, the Communist Party was the only stronghold resisting fascism. There was a lot of sympathy, especially in left-wing circles, for the notion that, you know, maybe it wasn't the worst thing in the world to collaborate with the Soviet Union, because, you know, who else was going to stop the rising fascist tide? And if there was any group of young men in the country who felt like they were entitled to be going against the popular mood of the nation, the Cambridge Five were definitely those people. You know, they shared a real superiority complex. Guy Burgess was described by a peer at Cambridge as being conceited. John Ken, Cross's brother, called him prickly. Philby was very charming, but almost clinically detached. And crucially, they were all from the right backgrounds. Upper middle class, private school boys waved through into the highest echelons of the security service and foreign office knowing that they would never be suspected of betraying the ruling elite to which they belonged. And this was one reason why the Kremlin were continually suspicious about the amount of material they were handing over. They actually suspected that the five were double double agents, that they were triple agents, because they just didn't believe that these guys are being handed over so many secret documents. They just didn't understand the class privilege that was at play and that was allowing them to just move around at that kind of a level. The other thing that at least two of the Cambridge Five had in common was homosexuality. Guy Burgess was quite promiscuous as a student at Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, And it wasn't said that Blunt was, but there was a lot of innuendo that maybe they'd slept together and they certainly lived together and had a house where there were lots of lovers coming and going. And that mattered because, of course, homosexuality was still illegal at that point. So it does 
add an anti-establishment frisson, doesn't it? That there's an element of, well, yes, I, I represent the British, but at the same time, this is a country that would throw me in prison if they knew who I really was. So that does naturally split your loyalty, rather. At the height of his relationship with Moscow, he was sending them material every week to photograph and return. And then he was kind of uh, wooed for the position of what was called then Keeper of the King's Pictures. To be fair, he didn't apply for that position. Again, it's the sort of thing that only happens to you if you're the right sort, right? <laughs> People are like, oh, you like art. You're the right kind. You've been in the government. Why don't you come and work in the palace? Yeah, I mean, his actual espionage activity mostly came to an end after World War II, except, as he later admitted, to help arrange Burgess and McLean's defections to Soviet Russia in 1951. He, he insisted very hard that he hadn't done any more spying for the Soviet Union after World War II, and then they sort of confronted him about Burgess and McLean, and he was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's basically just, you know, talking to friends, you know, helping some friends, get some <laughs> other friends. This was the activity that first put him seriously on MI5. Radar, and they interviewed him several times over the years, which is mad to think about as well. You know, they obviously had good reason to believe that he had been a Soviet spy. They just couldn't quite pin it on him until they got him to confess in 1964. Eleven times, eleven times. Yeah, yeah and he was con- allowed to continue working at the palace this entire time. I mean, obviously there wasn't much in the picture collection that was of interest to the Kremlin, but still, it seems like a ridiculous oversight. Yeah, I think access to the Queen might be of interest to the Kremlin, though. <laughs> <wouldn't you? laughs> And this is the amazing thing as well, that his espionage career really only began to surface publicly after the 1979 publication of a book by Andrew Boyle, which didn't name Blunt, but dropped enough clues about a fourth man. At this stage, they didn't know how many people were involved in this ring, and they'd only counted up to four by now, that members of parliament then raised the matter in the House of Commons. And that's what brought Thatcher to talk about this issue today. And she does it with a certain amount of outrage. You know, she's obviously she personally feels the affront that she knows the nation is going to feel that this guy was found out years ago and allowed to continue his work in, you know, that close to the Queen, among other things. Well, it perfectly played into Thatcher's worldview, though, didn't it? She was the right Prime Minister to to deliver this. Edward Heath never could have done it in the same way, because he was exactly the kind of establishment figure, but also operating outside the establishment (laughs) that uh, the Blunt was. But for Thatcher, her whole thing was like, like, I'm a different kind of Tory. I'm for working class Tories. And this old boys club that Blunt represented Mm. is exactly what we're standing against. We're a meritocracy. We're about work hard and you can do well. And that book that Boyle wrote, Climate of Treason, didn't mention Blunt. The spy was called Morris, which, if you know your E.M. Forster, was a homosexual academic. So there's sort of this innuendo Mm. in the book about who it actually is. But Boyle didn't reveal it. What happened is Blunt, via his solicitor, attempted to stop the publication of the book, even though he wasn't named in it, and the magazine Private Eye made that intervention public. So, yes, Thatcher revealed it in the House of Commons, but it had already been published. And the reaction was instantaneous in the chamber. Uh, The Labour MP Christopher Price expressed his disbelief of what he called almost two decades of deliberate cover-up simply in the interest of protecting an individual with powerful friends. Mm. And you can see that because soon afterwards, Blunt was stripped of his knighthood, at which point the palace had known of his spying activities for, uh, you know, uh, more than 10 years. It was obviously very much reputation management on behalf of the royal family rather than their disgust at just discovering that Blunt was a spy. But even he was engaged in the same kind of reputation reputational management, because even after this exposure in 1979, he wrote a memoir and gave it to the British Library with one condition, that it shouldn't be published for another quarter of a century, which obviously looks very much like a man who's trying to rewrite history always with an eye on his own reputation. And there was a review of his memoir by Ben McIntyre in The Times, and he just was absolutely scathing about it. He said, the book is suffused with regret and tinged with self pity. The decision to spy for the Soviet Union, he writes, was the biggest mistake of my life. Blunt regrets everything, but most particularly the way his espionage activities interfered with his career as an art historian. You know, he he was most worried about the fact that he was found out. He did later express some regret, but mostly you get the sense that the regret was his discovery. Yes, it's all dressed up in basically, oh, well, we all make mistakes when we're young. <laughs> like, I look at this now and, you know, Think of the eight years I was working for the Queen where I wasn't still a spy. (laughs) You know, I've changed. (laughs) Yeah, in his first official statement five days after he was exposed in the House of Commons, he issued a statement that was, was it an apology? Not really. I don't think it would have passed muster in the days of, you know, your tailored social media apologies. He says, 
this was a case of political conscience against loyalty to country. I chose conscience, which kind of boils down to, sorry, I was so idealistic, yeah, I guess. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry that my spying hurt your feelings, country. <laughs> Tomorrow. And then buckets of cash were thrown at them by the French government is the bit you're missing out. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.